Hello, Rantus. How's everybody doing? It's Tim Ringgold here. And uh, I am going to share with you in this presentation about music therapy and substance abuse treatment. I work in a clinical set in that clinical setting, and uh, I'm very proud of the work that takes place there. And so um, we kind of walk you through the uh, first of all, some important things about music, some important things about <clears throat> the clinical goals, and then some important things about the interventions that take place, okay? And then I'll give you some resources. Uh, so, as D e Dr. E. Thayer Gaston says, rhythm is the energizer and organizer, and it's important to remember that in every one of our bodies, we are a built-in rhythm machine. So, our, from the cellular level to the systems level, uh, we are rhythm. Uh, now, every client is a rhythm machine, right? Now, some are more coordinated than others, and so, but everybody already scratches, walks, talks in perfect rhythm every day. They hammer a nail in perfect rhythm. They bounce a ball in perfect rhythm. So everybody that you're working with in this population uh, has the ability to be rhythmic. And so that's really going to be, you're going to see why that's important here. And in our culture, uh, we have an ad campaign and we it really kind of underlines uh, Dr. Gaston's point that it's no coincidence that this uh, that the Energizer Bunny is holding a drum. Now, for our clients, um, they're used to you know uh, using music in an entertainment context, right? Um, they're massive consumers of music. Uh, some of them may be masochists and uh, have a little bit of uh, music education under their belt or you know music lessons. Probably none of them have had music therapy. So it's a new shape on the pegboard for them. And it's really important that if you're going to work with your clients that you lay down just you know the academic kind of allied health piece and these are you know, the kind of the head centered pieces of what you're doing with them. So they don't have any background around that. So it is important to be educating your clients uh, that music therapy is the thing. What they're doing is this, uh, you know, research based, evidence based practice. That's what we're doing with them and that there's going to be, you know, goals involved. And it's not just fun time. Uh, a little bit about me, and this is kind of the heart side of things that I want you to know about me and, and why I do what I do, is that um, on April 18th in 1995, my five best friends were murdered. Yeah, and I went to five funerals in four days. It was brutal. And I sang a goodbye song at all of their funerals, and it tore me up. And uh, it wasn't until the night of the last funeral, seven days after their murder, where I went to a concert with my one remaining friend. And um, during that concert, for two hours, I was at peace. And I finally understood what everyone was saying in my community. And no amount of drugs or alcohol was able to numb the trauma that I was going through that week. And believe me, I used a lot of both. Didn't work. But the music did. The music was the thing that was able to bring me physical, emotional, social, spiritual peace and healing and uh, relieve the pain and the trauma for the first time. And I really got very clear the power of music and what it can provide all of us in our darkest moments. So that's why I do what I do. And um, it's really a privilege to tell that story in that setting also because like I was drinking and smoking and using substance abuses or using substances myself and I know why I was using them. And this is why most people who are in addiction are addicted to substances is because they're trying to numb some sort of pain, some sort of trauma that they've been through. They either know it consciously or they know it unconsciously. It's, it's one or the other. I knew it consciously. I knew what I was trying to do. Uh, and it wasn't working, right? So that's an important piece for you to understand. I thought maybe just telling you a story from inside my life, you would uh, you'd realize that uh, what it sounds like on the, from the mind of someone who's st personally struggled um, with addiction, as well as someone who's been through trauma, like what the power of music provides. 
All right, so let's pull you out of your heart there and get back up into the brain. How does it work? We've got to cover a couple of slides on the brain. Um, you have to understand that we all know music's good for our emotions and good for our spirit. What most of us don't understand is that music's good for our bodies and for our brains. And that's where you can really separate yourself as a clinician. So first slide of the human brain, this is Homer Simpson. And as you can see, his brain is wired for sleep, donuts, and duff beer. Our brains are wired for music. Music, as you know or may not know, is the most complex stimulus in nature. It requires every subregion of the brain to process. And if you change any one individual element of music, you change the music. And then not only that, but larger parts of the brain have to process the music as well. And that's all happening in real time as we're listening to the music. And this doesn't even involve actual playing, right? So all of this is basically important to know that music is heavy lifting for the human brain. It's a cognitive load unlike anything else out there. In addition to that, it creates a reward. The brain issues a reward, a neurochemical reward, when it either listens to the music it enjoys or it makes music. So this is not an erector set. These are the chemical you know, compositions of dopamine, oxytocin, and prolactin. And they are associated with the uh, reward response, relaxation response and the empath empathic response. And all of these increase when the brain is either listening to music it enjoys or it's engaging in music making. So you're at, this is going to be a cute little an animated moment here. You're, you start here and when you start to listen to the music you enjoy or you uh, make music, you actually have a, you know, a happy, positive chemical reaction taking place in your brain. Now, uh, one chemical that's important to understand about is cortisol. It is a stress hormone associated with the stress response. Now, when you listen to the music you enjoy or you make music, that chemical decreases in uh, production in the body. And that's very important because what's happening in a stress response when the brain gets stressed, it triggers not only the stress response, it triggers a craving. And the craving is an attempt to self-soothe. So it doesn't know what's good for it. It just knows what works, right? So it will trigger a craving for whatever works. So the longer the brain is stressed and the longer cortisol is pumping, the more likely the person is going to experience cravings. So what we want is tools that reduce the stress response and turn it off as fast as possible. And music does that. So uh, here's the 20th century emojis from when I was a kid. <laughs> so if you've got some stress, add some music and you'll have some happiness. Now, let's talk about the clinical goals, okay? So I'm going to talk about five clinical goals that you're going to work on when you're working with clients with substance abuse. And P.S., I apologize for my voice. Um, been a long day. And uh, yeah, it just sounds terrible to me. It probably sounds terrible to you too. So <clears throat> I can't clear my voice. I can't seem to get it, get it, uh, get the frog out. So thank you for enduring it along with me. So the first clinical goal is to increase present moment awareness. Said another way, stay present. So um, when clients are future tripping or ruminating over the past, they're not present. And the human brain has no perception of control over the past or the future. It's very stressful for the brain to consider the past or the future. And the future is where worry and anxiety reside, which can trigger a stress response and a craving. In the past, we have shame, guilt, resentment, regret, all very negative emotional states that can also trigger an emotional stress response and a craving. So we want tools that can keep us in the present moment keep our attention in the present. And when we make music, one of the four ways we engage with it, with clients with substance abuse, when we make music, we have to be present because that's where the music's taking place. It's taking place in the present moment because music is time-based. This is contrary to music listening. Music listening absolutely has the power to take us out of the present moment. So that's why you want to do music making 
with clients who are dealing with substance abuse because you don't want to be taking them out of the present moment any more than they already are. All right, so anytime you engage in active music making, particularly clinical improvisation, that becomes that cognitive heavy load for them where they're trying to keep up with the beat or master the instrument, and they're very present as a result of that. The good news is they're not thinking about that. They're just present as a byproduct. The next clinical goal is to increase emotional expression. Said another way, open up. Right? So I want you to think about emotion uh, like the word email. So email is short for electronic mail. And uh, John Bradshaw was the first that I know to posit that emotion is short for energy in motion. So think of it this way. You think thoughts in your head, but you feel feelings in your body. And when you feel stressed, it eventually shows up somewhere physically in your body. You feel it. Could be your stomach, could be your heart, could be your lungs, shoulders, traps, right? Restless leg, uh, your jaw. So that energy is in your body, and we need tools to be able to get that energy out. Now, talking is a tool. It's a tool. It's not the only tool. And so the problem with talking is you need the right words and the right listener. We don't always have those as an option. Right? So we need other tools, particularly if the person has dealt with trauma, because trauma gets buried in the body. It's not an analytical thing. It's a post-verbal experience. The brain doesn't process it verbally, so it can't necessarily get it out verbally. So you need experiential, visceral modalities that will engage the body and get the body moving so you can move that emotion, squeeze that emotion out of the body. So express emotion. The third clinical goal is to increase creativity as a coping skill. Said another way, be creative. Creativity is the muscle we use to solve problems. Most people don't think of creativity in that way. People with substance abuse disorder or challenges are very creative. They had to be in order to deal with the illegality of their use or hiding it, the social impacts. So they used their creativity to get around the law or to get around their spouse or their parents. They used it, their creativity to get, you know, past, above, below, you know, so they were very creative in their use. And I tell guys all the time that we're going to harness that creativity and just point it towards recovery. That blows them away because now they realize they already have a muscle that's going to help them. So just think of this. Whenever you have a problem, when you solve that problem, what you're using is creativity to solve the problem. Not everybody is artistic, but everybody's creative. And anytime we make music, it's inherently creative. So we're building that muscle. Now, if you can uh, teach any type of music uh, inside of your therapy, getting guys to like saw or gals to solve a musical problem via an instrument, like copy a pattern, right? Be able to strum uh, a ukulele or a guitar, play chords. You are building their frustration tolerance and their creativity, which are absolutely things they're going to need in their healing journey. Next clinical goal is to increase relaxation as a coping skill. Said another way, escape stress. Sometimes the stress is in the present moment. We need to peace out and just take a break. The problem is, is that everybody reaches for something when they get stressed. For some, it's substances, it's drugs or alcohol. But for others, it's food or it's their phone or it's the Netflix button on their remote control. Right? So we need tools that we can reach for when we're stressed that don't cost us a lot of time or money or our physical health. Having a power playlist or a relaxation playlist is a really good tool because they can reach for music instead. And then lastly, 
the last goal is to increase interpersonal connection. Said another way, reconnect. So this is a big misconception or a big myth, uh, which is that when someone is in their room listening to their music, people are like, oh, they're isolating. Well, maybe, but maybe they're connecting to their music. Maybe the music's the only thing they feel safe connecting with. You know why? Because maybe the music's the only thing in their house that's not judging them, not scolding them, not punishing them, and not lecturing them for feeling what they're feeling or doing what they're doing. Music simply accepts them exactly where they are. And there are songs that have told our story better than we could ourselves. And when we hear our story in other people's songs, it's very powerful. It reminds us that we're not alone. And that's a very, very important thing for the human being because we are mammals and primates. And as the particular type of primate that we are, we're pack animals, which means we live in community and relationship from cradle to grave. So when we disconnect from each other, it causes discomfort and dis-ease, which if left unchecked can cause disease. So if you put all of those five goals together, increase present moment awareness, increase emotional expression, increase creativity as a coping skill, increase relaxation as a coping skill, and increase interpersonal connection. You've got five solid goals. The problem is no one can remember any of that because it's jargon. So my wife and I on a five hour road trip worked those goals into an acronym because acronyms work really well for people to be able to remember stuff. So we used it for my book which is called Sonic Recovery, Harness the Power of Music to Stay Sober. Now, sober is an acronym for the five clinical goals. Stay present, open up, be creative, escape stressors, and reconnect. Now, I used to share the clinical goals in clinical jargon with my patients all the time every week for years. And guess how many people would remember them? None. Not until we turned it into an acronym. Now, when we go over the goals at the beginning of group, people roll their eyes, but you know what they say when I say, what are the goals? What does music help you do? And they go, sober. And then I say, what does it stand for? And someone in the room knows at least one of the letters, and then someone else knows another letter, and someone else knows another letter. And now they remember. So this is important because for them, they have the buy-in now. Like, oh, music's good for me. This is a tool for me to help me recover in lots of ways. So music's not just effective, it's efficient. Meaning it can tick sometimes all five boxes at the same time. All right, let's talk about how do we do music therapy in this setting? So there's four ways that we really interact with the patients. We make it, we listen to it, we write it, and we relax to it. So let's talk about each one of those a little bit here. So first, we make it. Now, active music making is a cornerstone intervention for people in substance abuse because you want them engaging physically with your instruments, with their bodies, with present moment time, with each other. So music making allows them to do that. Now, the reason there's a picture of African drums there is because drumming is the easiest way to connect because everybody knows how to bounce a ball Everybody knows how to scratch an itch, and everybody knows how to hammer a nail. All three of those activities put a musical instrument in the way, and you're drumming a hand drum, or you're shaking a shaker, or you're drumming a sound shape. So people can be immediately successful 
at joining the groove. Now for you as the facilitator, if you're going to do clinical improvisation, you can start out with something as simple as the heartbeat. And everyone can start on the heartbeat. Everyone knows how to play a heartbeat. It's in their body. They've heard it since they were in the womb. And it's a very grounding, powerful um, pulse and pattern to play as a group. And anytime your group's getting a little out of control, the greatest thing to do is just bring them back to the heartbeat. And it grounds the group and brings everybody back together. So that's a really good tool. If you've got ukuleles that are available or guitars for strumming, there are guys who will be, or gals, who will be very curious and want to learn how to strum those or play those. And they may already have some experience. And I let them strum away, you know, do what they want. It usually gets drowned out by the drums anyway. Um, and so that's another option as well in the, you know, circle. And then there's also, you know, singing and vocalizing and rapping and getting guys to use their voices or gals to use their voices. And, you know, different strokes for different folks. Some people feel very comfortable starting with the voice and doing chanting. Some people feel very comfortable starting with the drums or with guitars. Whatever you feel comfortable with, that's the thing to lead into. But you want to get them making the music. That gets them out of that role as a consumer and into the role of a creative producer of the music. It's also very empowering for them because they may have a story that they're not musicians. And if you get them jamming, well, you've just destroyed that story. And then you can kind of say, well, what other labels do you have that are disempowering? Right, so it's an opportunity. All right. Next up, I was talking about, right, the first thing we do is we can make it. The second thing we can do is listen to it. So, you know, song analysis works great in this population because then we're not talking about them. We're talking about the artist. But of course, who are they talking about when they're talking about the artist? They're talking about themselves. They talk about what they resonate with and what they connect with. So oftentimes I'll pick a song that I know has themes that are central to addiction and recovery. We'll listen to the song and then I'll simply say, what did you connect with? And I'll give them the lyrics and I'll say, you know, before we start, uh, here are the lyrics. I want you to circle or underline any words or phrases or lines or paragraphs that you connect with. That's all. And then I'll just go around the room and I'll just say, what did you connect with? Right? Because one of my goals is reconnect. right? And so I want them to feel like they're connected to something outside of themselves, which is the song. And there's no right answer. right? So I'll have 10 people in a room and they'll connect with you know, five, six, seven different things in the song. Some people will connect with the same thing as someone else. Oh, guess what? Now they've just connected with each other. So this is a great way to introduce them to topics where they don't have to be talking directly about themselves to you. They're talking about the music, you're talking about the music, everybody seems to be talking about the music, but really what ends up happening is they start talking about themselves. So it's a great doorway into what's going on for them without you really having to ask. They'll volunteer that information. All right, next up is write it, right? So we've got make it, listen to it, write it. So songwriting doesn't have to be complex. You don't have to start from scratch. You can just do mad libs to an existing song. So what do I mean by that? You can take an existing song and delete some of the lyrics and put a blank and have them put something that's meaningful to them. So one song I use is Angel by Sarah McLaughlin. And in the chorus, you're in the arms of the angel. Well, in the Mad Libs version, it's you're in the arms of blank. And then under the blank space, it says, who supports you emotionally? Question mark. So they'll put like, you know, my grandma. And now they're writing out their own chorus to the song. And then I'll volunteer to sing the song. They can sing the song if they want. They rarely do that. So I'll sing it for them. And now they've written their own chorus. 
That's just one of many ways that you can approach songwriting in a modified way so that it's not starting from scratch because that can be daunting for either you or them. Now, there may be other times where you're dealing with clients who love to create lyrics or love to rap, and with a, a simple app like GarageBand or Launchpad, you can have them easily create a beat in a, just a minute, right? With either app, you're, you can create a cool beat in 60 seconds, and then they can actually record their own voice in either, or in, in GarageBand uh, over it, and you could track a song very quickly. That's not for everybody, but it's definitely possible. All right, next up is relax to it. So our first way we interact is make it. Second way is listen to it. Third way is write it. Fourth way is relax to it. This is so important for people with substance abuse because they don't know how to relax without medicating. So we need to teach them tools for them to calm down. When I'm writing, uh, when I'm doing a relaxation group, I'll put on the board how to chill out, period. And I'll say, that's the goal of the session. And the guys or the gals love it because they are so anxious feeling. They're not used to feeling. So this gives them a chance to just calm down, relax, chill out without using. And one of the techniques you can use is what's called remembered wellness. This is a protocol created by Dr. Herbert Benson at Harvard University, and it's very powerful where they simply think back to a time where they were happy, healthy, and sober, and you walk them through a memory of something really positive in their life. Now, for this puppy, I imagine that it you know, might be some trait like that. For me, you know, it's a vacation that I've been on. And I call it the relaxation vacation. And you play slow tempo instrumental music as you walk them back through their senses. Just, you know, what do you see, hear, smell, taste, and touch in that scene? And how did it make you feel? Now, this is so effective that I shared it back in 2017 at a conference. And then I gave it away as a gift. And one of the conference goers uh, wrote me and said, hey, uh, this helps my whole family at home. And then a year later, Cheryl wrote me again in 2018 to say, hey, it's me again and let you know we're still using it a year later. And then check it out. A year later, July of this summer, Cheryl hits me up on Facebook, shows me a picture of her son, Aiden's favorite relaxation music for three years and counting. Now, what's cool about that is that now, because he's using the same relaxation music every time, it has cued the relaxation response, right? So his brain knows to shut down when he hears that music. So we can use that very powerfully. So here's my gift to you guys. Um, if you would like the relaxation vacation, all you have to do is just text me. Um, so just text the word Sonic to this phone number. It's not my cell phone. It's like a text uh, program. And what you're going to get is some relaxation vacation audio files that you can use for yourself or with clients. And there's some that have like a script with me playing classical guitar in the background. Some of it's just the instrumental guitar. Some of it's just the script if you want to use different music in the background. You can use them with your clients. You can use them on yourself either way. You'll also get a relaxation app guide that has a bunch of relaxation apps and virtual instrument apps that are really good, that are either free or low cost. There's a music medicine guide that'll be a summary of a lot of things that I've went over here because we covered a lot here in 30 minutes. Um, you can go on to Bandcamp and pay me if you want, but really you're a student, so don't do that. Just text me. Um, when I'm doing this with groups, I just have them fill out a little comment card, but we're not together. So you're definitely going to want to use the phone number to text me and it'll just say, Hey, great. What's your name? Give me your name. Hey, great. What's your email address? And then check your spam folder and, uh, click on the link in the email and you'll go out to my website, download all of these things for your use. Okay. So go do that. All right. Last but not least resources. 
If you have a smartphone or a tablet, you have musical instruments. They are awesome. They look awesome. They sound awesome. And they're optimized for headphones, so no one else has to hear. Every month, um, if you opt in to get the relaxation audio, every month I'll send you a video demo of a different relaxation or virtual instrument app. So that's super cool. And then you'll also see all the other ones I've already done. So I've done the work for you and you can check them out. Okay, so we're at 30 minutes. Uh, West Music is the place to go for real instruments. They're super awesome uh, retailer. They have music therapy clinics in their retail stores in Iowa. Uh, you already know about musictherapy.org. If I can help you in any way, just text me and uh, or email me. And uh, yeah, that's what I got. So hope this was useful for you. And if you're ever frustrated, um, just email me and or message me on Facebook and I'll give you a pep talk. Okay. All right, gang. See ya.